Well, hello everyone again, and welcome to our weekly peer review. Um, today we've got a very exciting subject in our continuing series on trauma-informed and capable care. But today, particularly, we're going to do something that I, per I, I personally enjoy, and that is talking about EMDR psychotherapy, resourcing, regulation, and resiliency. This, to me, is the real uh, heart of it all in the end. And when we think about EMDR and that subject of resourcing and resiliency, um, self-regulation and so on, um, I go back to Joseph Wolpe, 1958-1959, in his landmark publication on what we called reciprocal inhibition, big fancy word. But basically what Wolpe did was is that he demonstrated empirically that when a negative stimulus program was um, continually implemented with a cat, there was a, an arousal pattern that occurred. From, you know, electrical shock, you know, a siren, electrical shock, siren, and you just hit the siren and the cat would spaz. So it created PTSD in the cat. And then reciprocally to turn it around when he associated the positive stimulus with the siren, the PTSD went away, the arousal went away. And from that came our concept today of desensitization. Whether that's through systematic desensitization, exposure, or any types of therapy that involve desensitization. So EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Well, of course, you know, what we're looking at here is the memory networks, as, as um, EMDR talks about, that memory networks are stored in associative linkages. And what does that mean? When I think about my high school romantic music, I have a positive association and I have a feeling that comes back up when I think of that special song. You know, and um, conversely, if I think of the most embarrassing memories in life or even the loss of loved ones, I have the association of all those same types of embarrassments and losses that are associated in that linkage. So both negative and positive memories are associated and linked. The entire memory network, the whole brain, is not all automatically linked together. That would be overwhelming. Imagine if all memories were absolutely associated at all times. I mean, we wouldn't be able to function, okay? But positive memories are metaphorically and or negative memories are metaphorically kind of hyperlinked, very much like you know on the internet when you create a hyperlink and you hit that, that 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 page goes to another associated page. Well, that's what happens when memories are stored. They're stored with these little hyperlinks, and traumatic memories are definitely hyperlinked. This one to that one to that one to that one. Usually, of course, in the negative. So we don't naturally link, unfortunately, um, disturbing memories with good ones. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't naturally do that. And, and that's really where um, EMDR comes in. And EMDR resourcing, EMDR psychotherapy resourcing does exactly that. So what do we think we're doing, actually, when we make these positive links? I guess I would use sort of a, a dramatic analogy going back to Wolpe. Wolpe was looking at reciprocal inhibition and, and, and he was looking at the physical analogy of the reciprocal muscles in the muscular system. So if, in an, using a, an example, if I picked up a heavy bucket and I sprained the muscle in my arm, I would get a muscle spasm. The muscles would swell up, attempt to contain the damaged tissue, blood vessels and blood cells would contain it my muscle would lock. Conversely, in trauma, the same thing's happening. The memory has become over-aroused and become contained, locked, stored dysfunctionally, as Francine Shapiro would say in, her, in the adaptive information processing model. And that would be locked. And so if you, you know, I tried to pull this, the spasm would be trying to protect the damaged muscle, just like the stored memories are attempting to protect the damage or, or dis disturb memory protected from awareness and everyday functioning. 
if I tried to pull on that directly, I'm going to get resistance and I'm, a, I'm a going to get an absolute resistance. But in reciprocal inhibition, physical therapists knew that if, in fact, we, instead of pulled, we turned around and we pushed and pushed and pushed, suddenly the muscle would relax because the reciprocal resource muscles would tell the damaged ones that they'll help handle the situation. And all of a sudden we're going to go, notice that, okay, I, my hand's open. Well, in a way we're doing the exact same thing with the MDR resourcing. Physical therapists and occupational therapists knew about reciprocal inhibition in the 50s and the 60s. And they used this in physical and brain injury. They also knew about bilateral stimulation and they used that as well. But they didn't make the next step. They didn't take it the next step into psychotherapy. Along comes Francine Shapiro. And there she is walking through the park. The, the, the sort of apocryphal story where she's walking through the park and she has a disturbing memory and she notices she's walking and she also notices that her eyes are sort of moving and all of a sudden the disturbing memory abates, goes away. And that reminds me of course of Nikola Tesla and he's walking through the park, you know, and he has this you know, amazing you know, vision of, you know, alternating current. He walked to a park in Prague, you know, but I don't quite get it. When I walk through that park in Prague, I just got lost. <laughs> I wonder what that's saying. Anyways, back to the story. So building on some of Wolpe's ideas, EMDR Shapiro developed the EMDR adaptive information processing model that dysfunctionally stored contained memory gets locked in the brain. Weaving adaptive memories and resources into traumatized memory networks, weaving them in. What we've learned to do is by taking positive memories, adaptive memories, weaving them into traumatized memory networks, lowers arousal and distress, brings it down. So if you make, in other words, a traumatic association is taking a traumatic event and associating with that memory and continually reassociating. Well, reverse the process and take a traumatic memory and create a new memory network with an existing positive resource memory. And guess what you've done? You've linked that resource in the brain to your own adaptive information, your own experiential capacity. And by doing so, we begin to lower arousal or distress. And this helps shift states from amygdala reacting to the mindful observer because I'm mindfully making that association wow I, well, I was able to drive very well over here and did that and then and then I had a car accident and, and then I found myself anxious driving well wait a minute let me go back to remember a, a memory of positive driving and all of a sudden I'm creating a new linkage between a positive adaptive memory and a, a disturbing one so, it, and I'm doing that through the mindful observer, resulting in what we believe is improved functioning of the medial prefrontal cortex. We believe that that's what we're actually beginning to bring back online by doing that. So, EMDR takes that a little bit further. And we go back to Wolpe again. And we begin to measure our distress with Wolpe's scale, his subjective unit of distress scale. The most commonly used scale in the world, you see it in the hospitals, the pain scale. Zero to ten, how distressful is the pain? Wolpe's scale. Okay. And, and what we're doing now a lot in our own therapies here in Greenwell is we've developed a similar, uh, our own type of scale, which we call the belief of capacity scale where individuals and others measure the person's client's belief and their capacity to achieve their goals and objectives. So we begin to not only look at distress, but also our capacity to achieve our goals and objectives. And that's a one false seven true Likert scale developed by our Greenwell group. And this focuses, focuses on adaptive behaviors um, and it re resulting from successful EMDR psychotherapy to see how it does it play out in terms of actually changing adaptive behavior. Perhaps it's a way of containing distress when we measure our distress. Perhaps it's that, maybe it does that. When we say that I'm distressed zero to 10, 
implies that the distress isn't zero to a million. And by doing so, there's a containment. And again, using the observer, the prefrontal cortex, we're coming online with mindfulness and we're observing and regulating that distress by measuring it. So just by learning how to measure our distress and measure our capacity, we begin to become more regulated and capacitated. It's simply the fact of measuring does it. Is that mindfulness? Perhaps. Perhaps it is. So it's speculated that establishing the observer of internal measures brings about a medial frontal cortex, online stimulation, lowers distress, improves regulation, and self-initiates internal changes in internal states. Self-initiates changing states. I'm disturbed, I'm, now longer dis I'm no longer disturbed, I can do that myself. I'm angry, I'm no longer angry, and I can change that state myself. That's self-regulation training. So what are the benefits, metaphorically, of using the whole database of adaptive memory networks? Well, compartmentalization takes a lot of energy to keep disturbing memories out of our everyday operating system and keeping them in their compartment sucks up a huge amount of functioning energy, enormous amount of energy that would otherwise be available for resiliency. We're sucking up that energy. Regulating states, being able to regulate our states when we're upset, being able to downregulate, saves a lot of energy because you're not burning up your nervous system through over adrenal fatigue. Executive decision making saves energy, time, and external resources. As we say, a stitch in time saves nine. And, uh, you know, as AA says so well, you know, insanity is repeating the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. That takes a lot of energy. And we avoid re-traumatizing ourselves by making decisions that simply aren't well thought through. There's a huge amount of resiliency and resource energy saved in that process. Huge. That's immeasurable. So with your permission, I'd like to wax a little philosophically about EMDR, its resourcing and resiliency um, capacities, just from my own experience. I'd like you to consider for a moment, just consider. If you're looking particularly at traumatic developmental memories that are metaphorically frozen in time, stored dysfunctionally, as Shapiro would say, in the part of the brain, even dissociated, frozen in time, trauma time, trapped in trauma time, as Francine Shapiro would say, under skilled professional care when they're processed, they may potentially release into the here and now coping system, all the frozen human developmental potential that they have programmed to express. They have yet to express this because they've been in stasis, these capacities, metaphorically parts of self, if you wish to use that term, parts of self. That programming that was developmentally latent and ready to go, that was never fully expressed, comes into the operating system. Metaphorically, they've just begun to fully achieve the operationalization of their plan program here and now. I'd like to see them as akin to, I'm going to use a metaphor, psychological stem cells. And the implications of this for psychological transformation may end up for the individual organism being quite profound. Quite, quite profound. So, just consider that. So in wrapping up, review, linking adaptive memory with traumatic memory resources. The trauma becomes adaptively resourced, resulting in improved regulation. Better regulation can result in improved executive decision-making. Improved executive decision-making saves energy. And all of this together with successful EMDR psychotherapy can result in improved 
resiliency, having more rebound and sustainable energy, and adaptive information processing. And what we see then is an organism that is more highly resilient and adaptive in daily action systems, more adaptive every day in those daily action systems of love, work, play, in these demands, and also in exploration of the world in which we live. Exploration. So on behalf of the Greenwell Conservancy, um, I'd like to thank you for attending our weekly peer review and invite you again, hope to see you again, for our continuing series and studies on trauma, informed and capable care.